So we've been talking about tonal values for the past couple weeks, and I hope today to uh, push that concept a little further and relate that to mood or the sort of sensation that a landscape or a moment in nature gives us. You're looking at the flat irons of Boulder, Colorado, and uh, not far from where I grew up, but we're seeing it in a misty morning type of scenario where a mist has come down and softened a lot of the edges and dulled the light. Uh, this can be ex thought of uh, in terms of tonal values. We've been talking about simplifying. Uh, this is last week's work from uh, Algarve, and I've simplified it into three values, a big mid-tone, uh, a large light, and a smaller dark. And it's a st uh, very much a simplification, but to this step helps us to present our final picture with a variety of tonal values and colors. Today's subject, painted in black and white, you see how much closer the tonal values are. There's not the dynamic range that we had in the previous week. And this contributes to the overall mood that we're trying to generate, one of softness, one of diffuse light, one of uh, a misty distance. The tonal values are very, are much, much closer in relation than they are in a very brightly lit scene. So that's going to be our project today. And yes, <clears throat> um, tonal values are basically the lights and darks, as, as I've been explaining. But uh, when we give some thought to how we're going to use them, and how we're going to generate interest with them or generate a sensation like uh, we're trying to today, they become a tool for us. And it's not the easiest um, concept to bring out in your painting. It takes some time to get used to it, some time, and a lot of uh, actually experimentation to become comfortable with manipulating tonal values to suit your needs but it's a skill worth having and worth the effort in your painting. So in today's demonstration, you see me starting from uh, the sky and I placed a very light gray into the sky and I'm following that up while the sky is wet with some um, pale indications of those distant trees. And I'm doing this with an awareness of the, the wetness of the paper. It's a whole nother subject and one that um, I present in, a, in another YouTube video that I'll list at the beginning of, or at the description of, of this video, which is a, a video on edges, edge control. And that very much relates to our watercolor technique and edges also relate very much to mood. So in this painting, um, I'm very conscious of the wetness of the paper and I'm trying to apply, especially this distant area, with a thought to uh, getting some uh, softer edges in the distant trees. And I'm doing that um, basically wet into wet or dry into wet. For the moment, I'm leaving the actual flat irons rather pale. I'm not um, t uh, painting them as of yet. I'm more concerned with uh, shaping them via these trees, the, um, the pine trees, and uh, later on I'll add a tint, uh, a warmer tint to make them come out. I'm also doing a couple other things that you're probably picking up on. One is I'm muting the color a lot. This is also typical of a a gray day or a misty day. The bright color that we're used to seeing is much more um, grayed out or much more subdued. It's probably a better word. And this contributes to that sensation of a misty morning. Edges, colors, tonal value scale uh, in this, the, the approximate values are going to be much closer together. So my lightest light and my darkest dark are going to be much closer on the value scale 
than say the previous week's painting of Algarve where they were on almost opposite ends. Another thing that's a slight, that's different in this painting or in uh, many paintings where you want to generate a similar mood is the mid value. The mid value tends to be the uh, largest value in the painting, uh, the, the value that occupies the most space. And of course, we're talking generalizations, but the mid value in a painting like today will be rather light, whereas the mid value in last week was actually rather dark. And so these things are all variables and coming to understand how they work together and um, being able to ma manipulate them in your painting is a big tool, a tool that you'll find really useful regardless of color, regardless of the hue, I should say, whether it's blue, green, red, yellow, doesn't matter as much to me as that light and dark aspect. Um, I'm in the habit these days of doing value studies for almost every painting before I begin to approach it with color, and I find it a big help and a big step in uh, being able to render the color more accurately with a greater confidence. And um, so I find it a, a understanding that's helped me and my work a lot, and that's why you hear me talking about it so much. <laughs> and really, I'm not alone. The, if you have studied with other artists, taken workshops, or in, uh, in university, uh, you know how much emphasis these artists place on lights and darks. Many of them say that um, this is the most important uh, fundamental to come to understand, and it's not an easy one. We think we understand the concept light and dark very readily, but being able to decipher it in nature and uh, apply it to our painting and be able to use it creatively, these are things that take time. So um, this is really just an introduction. And uh, I'm finishing up the lower section of the painting now with a more bright color, the bright color of the, uh, the summer green that we see uh, in the foothills around the flat irons. This area is called Chautauqua. They have a beautiful art center just above Boulder, and it's one of the more popular areas to go and hear a summer concert or to take a hike through the, through the foothills or just to sit and uh, enjoy the view. I'm putting on some finishing darks now to the flat irons themselves, especially this one that's more prominent, more visible, and has a higher tonal contrast. I want to pull that forward. I want to give it a little sharper focus. So I've left a little white on the forward edge. This is not in the photo, this is um, something that happened along the way and I see it's working and I'm going to leave it. Uh, so I'm adding some of those divisions. I'm leaving that white shimmering edge alone. I'm going back in and, and um, adding a few more of these pine trees to um, make the flat iron a little more visible. And uh, the painting is, is got to its essence. It's basically there. What I'm doing at this point is making adjustments. And I find it's a, a stage that's almost always necessary in a watercolor is things will dry perhaps a little lighter than you expected, a little darker than you expected, and um, to balance the painting or to finish the painting we need to add some adjustments or we need to go back in and add some colors. I'm doing now to certain areas, uh, refine the focal area. Um, sometimes it means losing an edge, as it were, making the edge a little softer. So this is the finished painting. And um, from the beginning, I was trying to create a sort of subdued painting where the atmosphere is descending on the flat irons and creating soft edges and a misty distance. Um, along the way, I accidentally stumbled upon this bright shimmering edge of one of the flat irons, and I applied that to the tree in the lower section to give us a, 
a focal area, a major focal area, and a minor focal area. Here's some other uh, value patterns, we call them. Here is a two-value pattern, and it's a simplification of, this is, I think, in the Utah. Another one where we have a strong mid-tone, a large bright, followed by a small dark area, very high contrast. A snowy day in the flat irons where, again, the values are subdued, a uh, mid-tone of light nature, the, the small mid uh, dark mid-tone and a small light area. So I hope that was helpful.